Good morning. My name is Glenn Nierman. I teach at the University of Nebraska Lincoln in Lincoln, Nebraska, USA. I'm pleased to be with you this morning to give this presidential session presentation. I'm sorry that we can't be together, and I'm sure we would all rather be together in person, but this is a viable alternative. The title of my presentation is Using Assessment to Enable Young Musicians' Musical Growth, an Issue of Equity. On the surface, the terms assessment and enable would appear to be unlikely candidates to appear in the same title. Enable seems to bring forward positive connotations of approval, facilitation, and empowerment. On the other hand, assessment seems to have negative connotations that may include feelings of anxiety, the possibility of failure, and a sense of fundamental skills and abilities that might be found wanting. Some of the reasons for this, neg uh, this negativity might be the lack of resources for meaningful assessments, or perhaps the lack of actual good measurement tools themselves. Sometimes teachers lack the time to administer good assessment tools, or they may have a negative attitude towards uh, high stakes assessment. Some of these negative attitudes are rooted in deep seated beliefs and others are simply rooted in tradition. With all of this negativity surrounding assessment, how then can assessment be seen as an enabling tool? Well, perhaps the answer lies in the fact that music for all students is an equity issue. Music and the arts have something to offer that is very important for all young people in our society, and without it, there's a danger that these young people might not be prepared to live a quality personal life or work in the 21st century workplace. The purpose of my presentation is to suggest that assessment can take on a facilitating function. If it loses some of its negative connotations rooted in the nature nurture controversy and the aptitude achievement conceptualizations of the past, and it moves forward toward a more diagnostic enabling conceptualization that will promote musical growth in all students. The presentation today has three parts. The first part concerns access to music education and convincing you that it is a matter of equity. Secondly, I will try to explain how assessment could be a tool for overcoming these inequities. And finally, then, we will look at how a term I'll call enabling factors research could address some of these inequities in music education. Music for every child, every child for music. The slogan of the century, as it's sometimes called, was coined in 1923 by one of the pioneers of American music education and a former NAFME, at that time MENC, president, Carl W. Gerkins. This simple statement became a mantra that has spanned generations and continues to represent the field of music education today. It expresses the long-held belief that we as music educators must strive to provide meaningful and inspiring experiences for every child. To date, however, U.S. music educators are far from achieving their mission of music education for all. Every 10 years, the U.S. government conducts an assessment called the National Assessment of Educational Progress in all subject areas. The last one in music was in 2016. In this assessment, it was found that access and achievement in music differed by region, by SES, that is by income, and by race and ethnicity. In a recent study by Ken Elpis and Carla Sabril, in which they profiled who enrolls in high school music, a number of significant 
inequities were uncovered. A couple of those are as follows. First, they found that only 24% of the 2013 class enrolled in a music ensemble for one year. Now, these were students in the class of, uh, of, of 2013. And uh, this data was taken from the US Department of Education. Secondly, they found that lower SES schools were less likely to offer music instruction. Clearly, there are a number of young people in America schools who are not receiving continuous instruction that might support meaningful encounters with music for a lifetime. These inequities impact children who do not have access to music in the arts, and consequently, their ability to lead quality personal and professional lives. So, whose, whose interest really should be served? Well, the key word in this phrase is, is all, of course. Music education must not be only for the gifted few, in my words, but for the not so gifted many. If this premise for all, that music is for all students is accepted, then it stands to reason that music educators should embrace instructional strategies that would promote musical benefits for all. I certainly would acknowledge that assessment has some negative connotations. Music educators must look beyond these, these weaknesses that we mentioned before. Uh, you know, they, they, they lack the assessment tools. They lack time to give the assessments. They're concerned because of high stake assessments. They have to move beyond that, uh, however, uh, and uh, uh, to look to assessment as a tool that will unlock the door to meaningful encounters with music and the arts. Music and the arts have something very important to offer all young people says Lucy Green and others, and without it, there's a danger that these young people may not be prepared to live a quality life. Well, what are some of these skills and understandings that are nurtured and awakened by studying music in the arts, and why are they so important? I will mention three. First, self-expression. Secondly, interpersonal skills. And finally, understanding yourself. It is beyond the scope of my time with you today to make the argument that each of these skills and understandings are basic core skills for life and they are such essential elements that one would be disadvantaged uh, without them simply as one would be disadvantaged if they didn't learn to read. This case would not be difficult to make however. Elliot Eisner argues that the core of all arts education is the ability to express oneself, to create art, or some might say, produce art-like creations, says Eisner. Students should acquire a feel for what it means to transform their ideas and images and feelings into an art form. <clears throat> Acquiring interpersonal and social skills, while not the sole province of music or arts education is certainly viewed by parents and other stakeholders as an important function of music education. And today we certainly see a lot of emphasis on social emotional learning. In fact, I did a workshop with my uh, uh, cooperating teachers this summer uh, and brought in uh, Scott Edgar, who is a very um, uh, well-known specialist in this particular area. <clears throat> Socrates, perhaps the greatest teacher of ancient Greece, taught his students that it's important to, to quote, know thyself, unquote. Reamer wrote eloquently about the importance of the arts in helping those uh, of us to understand feelings. And feelings, of course, lead to be able to understand uh, uh, emotions. So uh, emotional well-being and stability are the foundation of a purposeful and personal life. The De Patel for Kids organization is a national nonprofit committed to collaborating with school systems and communities to realize the power and promise of 21st century learning. You see their mission uh, on the screen here. 
and look at the companies who also support them. Crayola, Disney, there's lots of good money behind this particular effort. One of the most well-known facts about the Partnership for the 21st Century Skills is the P21 Frameworks for 20th Century Learning Model, which describes skills, knowledge, and expertise students should master in order to live and work in the 21st century. Look at the top arc of this particular model. Here are the familiar four C's, which the P21 folks call learning and innovation skills. Critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. These three items, these four items, excuse me, could we music educators ourselves have authored a more amiable list of skills and understanding to which we are prepared to contribute? I think not. In American music education, the 2014 musical standards called for all students to develop their creative potential through composing and improvising. Images and sounds carry powerful messages in our life space. We seek to help students understand this communication and to make value judgments about them. The performing groups so prevalent in American secondary music curricula are fertile soil for the development of two of those C's, uh, collaboration and certainly critical thinking. Yes, assessment in these areas of creativity and communication is subjective, but there are some skills and understandings that are prerequisite to these higher order processes that can be objectively assessed. The National Association for Music Education, just shortly after the publication of the National Core Arts Standards, produced the Model Cornerstone Assessments document that leads teachers to develop their own cornerstone assessments necessary for musical growth. Well, I hope I've established that having music in children's lives can unlock important skills and understandings that prepare them to lead a quality personal life and to be prepared for the 21st century workplace. It now remains for me to explain how assessment can further music learning and favorable dispositions toward music. Area two of the presentation talks about assessment as a tool for overcoming inequities. And there are three major portions to section two. I'm gonna review first a, a short history of assessment in the United States. Then I'm going to get to a key point of replacing aptitude with the concept of enabling factors. And finally, then I will talk about how we assess these music enabling factors. The history of assessment in the United States perhaps begins in the early 20th century with Carl Seesure and his measures of musical talent. These were a series of tests, pitch discrimination, timbre discrimination, duration distinction, tonal memory, and so forth. Uh, all separate abilities, according to Seashore, and he believed very strongly that they were inherited. A couple of decades later came James Mercer, who said, no, no, Carl Seashore, you have all this wrong. Uh, the environment plays a hugely important role in the development of musical ability. And so was born the nature nurture conference controversy. Is music aptitude a product of nature and inherited, or is it learned? Now I'm gonna take just a time out here to talk about two terms, music aptitude and music achievement. So music achievement uh, is simply means uh, uh, what the student uh, has learned, all right? And music aptitude talks about the capability of the st student to learn uh, musical content. I'm going to focus most of my attention in this presentation on musical aptitude. Early music aptitude scholarship, that of Seashore, as I mentioned before, um, was centered on the concept of music aptitude as a product of nature. 
That is, we have certain genes, uh, musical talent is inherited, and you either have it or you don't. More recent scholarship, that particularly of Rudy Radosi and David Boyle, talks about a combination of genetic endowment and <clears throat> environmental learning that contributes to music aptitude. Radosi and Boyle conceptualized that musical capacity was the term we should use to describe genetic endowment, what we bring to musical learning from our genes. But then they acknowledged that maturation and informal environmental learning, like exposure to music through concerts and through the media and so forth, may contribute greatly to the capability to learn music. Even more recent aptitude scholarship comes really from outside of music. Um, there, there is a person, uh, uh, Ridley, uh, who really is a scientific reporter. That is, his job is to take the more complex concepts of scientific researchers and write them in such a way that the average member of the public could understand them. Ridley contends that genes are not puppet masters or blueprints, nor are they just the carriers of heredity. He said, quote, they are active during life. They switch each other on and off. They respond to the environment, unquote. So, in other words, Ridley really believed that the nature-nurture continuum is really not a relevant construct for us today. Now, given all this re recent activity in the area, I have embraced a certain construct of music aptitude for this presentation. I believe that music aptitude is a product of both nature and nurture. And I would agree with Ed Gordon that music aptitude is developmental in its uh, origins. Because music aptitude is responsive to the environment, it can be enhanced through learning. In other words, it is developmental. So if music aptitude indicates potential for learning, and if music potential can be improved by learning, then it stands to reason that using assessment to diagnose musical learning strengths and weaknesses could assist music educators in helping to grow the skills and competence and musical abilities of all learners. After all, the diagnostic function of tests and measurements to improve the health of individuals is a well-established practice in the medical profession. We don't enter the doctor's office without having our temperature ta taken and our pulse checked. Why couldn't we measure and assess learners' music aptitude to improve the ability to encounter music? Well, I will acknowledge that there might be a problem with the connotations of aptitude. Aptitude testing was connected from the earliest days with IQ. IQ was something that was inherited and not learned. Thus, by association, music aptitudes was conceptualized as inherited. One either had musical talent or you didn't. Despite the research of Gordon and others, who view aptitude as a combination of both nature and nurture, the negative connotation of music for the talented few, not for all, persists. I propose that we not talk about music aptitude as a construct, but instead talk about what are the enabling factors that will allow us to increase musical learning and understanding. <clears throat> the concept of enabling factors is not one that I really created, but I certainly embrace the label of music enabling factors and promote the idea that musical growth can occur in all children. Tim Brophy is the person who really coined this concept of enabling factors. In fact, I have the quote here on the screen. Brophy believes that it is important to assess, quote, enabling competencies and fundamental oral discriminations. All right? And uh, so that is 
uh, um, uh, critical. Enabling factors can be accessed to diagnose the child's musical strengths and weaknesses, to measure the individual's current music abil ability. This is important because it offers an objective basis for programmatic, curricular, and instructional changes that can be based on learners' individual differences. Well, what are the enabling factors? Brophy has four enabling competencies, he called them, and they are the ability to keep a steady beat or beat competency, imitation or echo competency, following or mirroring competency, that is the ability to follow the teacher's motions or actions when listening to music. And then the fourth one is the kinesthetic musical response. That is the ability to express aesthetic qualities with movement, much as per Dal Crow's Eurythmics. My daughter and I teamed with Bruce Pearson of the Chost Music Company to study eye-hand coordination a few years ago. And we found that eye-hand coordination might be an important enabling factor for instrumental music study. Brophy's four fundamental discriminations are those that are very common to many music aptitude tests. High, low, long, short, loud, soft, and fast, slow. Well, we move now to the third segment of the presentation. And I would like to address the question, how could enabling factors research address inequities in music education? The implications of unequal music education opportunities that currently exist both nationally and in <clears throat> around the world, I would say, are staggering. The benefits of music in the lives of all people children who then become adults, discussed earlier in this presentation, should be available to all. Perhaps one way to address these existing inequities is through enacting policies that are supported by research that suggest that all children can grow and prosper. The process of enacting policies could be conceptualized as aligning constituencies and evidence into what HOPE calls a policy framework. HOPE defines a policy framework as, quote, a constellation of such forces and resources moving together or in parallel to fulfill a common purpose, unquote. In other words, a policy framework might be conceptualized as the lay of the land or the political environment in which a policy is conceived. Let's take a look at the policy framework for what might be policy that would help us move closer toward music for all children. I see the frame as being in four parts. The first part of our policy framework would be filled by special interest groups like the Music Education Roundtable that's sponsored by the National Association for Music Education in the US. That includes the American Choral Directors Association, the uh, American R. Schulberg Association, uh, many, many other uh, fine music organizations. And also um, those organizations with more social agendas like the NAACP, the National Association for uh, Colored People which are very interested in terms of equal access to all. A second part of the frame might be the politicians themselves, who are also concerned about equal access to education at all levels. At the root of the frame, I put music teacher educators and researchers, because those are the people who would bring systematic research about the effects of music enabling factors measurement to the coalition. Anyone who has tried to en enact policy legislation knows that it takes data, it takes numbers, it takes evidence, and the music teacher educator resources, uh, researchers could provide this information. And then finally, the frame might be filled by a fourth group who are the parents themselves who are most interested in a quality life for their children. The result of this powerful coalition could be 
policy that would lead us closer to music education for all. Recently, I had a chance to work uh, on this uh, assessment policy handbook. Um, Dr. Tim Brophy was the editor of this uh, book, and uh, I wrote a chapter about perspectives uh, on assessment policy in North America. I found that the concept of well-rounded education appeared really throughout North America, and that music was considered a part of that well-rounded education. Here we see it in the nation of Mexico, as my friend Patricia Gonzalez Moreno reports uh, in this quote. In Canada, also the term well-rounded education appears. In the United States, we had the signing of the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, in December of 2015 by President Barack Obama. We in the National Association for Music Education called this the Great December Christmas Present because we've been lobbying for this so long. And on the next slide here, uh, we won't have time to read all of that uh, definition right now, but uh, what does well-rounded education mean? Well, it means that uh, there would be certain courses and activities and programming in certain subjects. And notice that music is included as one of those core subjects. Now, why is this so important? Well, because it opens doors for funding, for research, uh, for the development uh, of teachers in terms of professional development and so forth, because music is a part of a core or a well-rounded um, subject. There are also several policies in ESSA that pertain to teacher evaluation and addressing student achievement. Further, as ESSA regulatory policies are now being developed, the possibility of funding for professional development and for the development of new assessment processes now exists, all because music is listed as a well-rounded subject. So in conclusion, I'm very optimistic, very optimistic. Change and equality are within our grasp. Thank you very much for attending to my presentation and thank you very much to the ISME board for inviting me to do this presentation. If you would like to discuss further any of the concepts or the ideas that I have in this presentation, please email me. It's really a simple email address, gnearman at unl.edu. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.